Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the, uh, this afternoon's discussion session with our distinguished panel of keynote speakers and uh, invited senior academics. Um, I'm Deborah Arnold, I'm Director of Learning Technology at the University of Burgundy in France. Um, despite my accent, I am also French as well as English. And um, I'm a member of the Eden Executive Committee as well and uh, it's very, very great pleasure for me to see so many people in the room for this uh, session which I hope will uh, give us, us a chance for um, a lot of interactive discussion with the speakers that we've heard um, over the past couple of days and uh, also with one speaker who will be uh, uh, giving a presentation and keynote uh, tomorrow. So that's uh, Ingeborg. Um, so we have uh, with us uh, on, the, on the panel um, Jule Hege, who was, uh, who's from the European Commission, who spoke uh, in the keynote yesterday. We have Bob Fryer, who was uh, in the same session uh, Bob Fry from the Campaign for Learning. Uh, we have um, David White and uh, Dale J. Stevens, who you um, probably heard uh, this morning if you were here for the plenary. Uh, Ingeborg Bo, um, ex-Eden president who's uh, with us and uh, who's going to be uh, talking about um, uh, her grandchildren and their needs for uh, her iPad um, in, the, in the plenary, closing plenary tomorrow. Uh, we also have with us um, Gerd Teitelstad from, the, uh, uh, from ICDE and uh, Paolo Diaz, the rector from uh, uh, Universidad de Alberta, who've been very, very supportive of the conference um, in providing the, uh, the web streaming support and filming. So um, from the keynotes and the different sessions that uh, uh, we've had, had the chance to, to listen to, we've been delving into issues relating to policy, philosophy, notions of unschooling, hearing about grassroots and more institutional, initi institutional initiatives. Sorry, um, And a recurrent theme that would appear um, to emerge from the conference is um, the fact that current systems and institutions appear to be a long way off um, being able to deal with the educational challenges that we're facing today and for the foreseeable future. Uh, I thought this was summed up very nicely um, by David White, who quoted Bob Fryer um, on the, uh, with this uh, quote, if education just endorses the status quo, we have a long way to go. And so I'd like us to think about that in relation to the theme of uh, this 21st Eden Annual Conference, which um, has been focusing on closing the gap from Generation Y to mature lifelong learners, um, which was nicely illustrated by the panel that we had this morning um, from different ends of the spectrum and different approaches as well. So to kick off the discussion, uh, I'd like each of you just to say as, in as few words as possible um, what open learning generations means to you? Because this is the title of the conference. We're talking about closing the gap. What does the notion of open, journey, open learning generations mean to you? So I can see uh, Bob nodding on the end. So if you'd like to kick <laughs> us off on that. <laughs> I, I only nodded because I thought it's a great question. Um, so just thinking aloud what it means to me, it means to me a great promise. And the promise is that by open learning, dim many dimensions of what we mean by open learning, because we mean many different things, the product of that will be to challenge existing providers of learning to change themselves, to change what they mean by learning, to change how they achieve that learning and how they reward that learning. My concern is that up to now, a great deal of innovation has been to do with giving people access to relatively unchanged institutions. So the promise of more open learning for me is actually to challenge the existing institutions of learning and particularly I'm interested in the challenge that that can represent to higher education. Okay, thank you for that. Would anybody else like to, to pick up on that? Each person will get the chance to, uh, uh, to react to that. David? Yeah, well, I I, I would like to say that I think that our universities are doing a brilliant job at reproducing themselves. Most universities, as far as I can see, have as their criterion of ultimate success is that you become a university researcher and a university lecturer and a university professor and end up as a university rector growing more of yourself. And that's a wonderful thing to do, but it's not really 
sufficient for our society. And it's high time that the university broke out of that. Uh, at the commission, we had a, a, an excellent think tank. And there was a wonderful woman called Catherine Lynch, who's based at Trinity College Dublin, and I, I think she's still there, who was constantly telling us that the job of the university and of the educational system is not simply to be captured by the success group of society. It's to find, help other people to find the successes too. And uh, the, Bob's point was an extremely important one. And I think the existing system has not been very successful at that. And the open learning system is challenged in trying to bring it about. OK, Edgar, would you like to come in on Yeah, well, a short story. When Bill Clinton and Al Gore took over the American government back in the 90s, they uh, formulated a campaign, a reinventing government. And the background was lack of trust. Citizens didn't trust governments in the way they should. And uh, believe it or not, but that campaign made a lot of people worldwide enthusiastic for reinventing their governments. I worked at that time in, in changing Norwegian government. I think we need to formulate something like that for the educational system. It needs to be reinvented for our time. And we have to regain the trust of the population, of the students, of the youth. That's it. This is a system for them that builds on their creativity, that builds on their curiosity, and that meet the challenges from the more open and online world. Okay, um, Ingeborg wants to come in. I'm sure Dale's got something to say on this point as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll share this one. Um, I think uh, um, uh, open learning generations um, I, have, I want to go a step further, looking at the, the theme of this conference. In order to achieve open learning generations, we have to close the gap between the generation, generation Y and the mature learners. And uh, that, is, that is what we as the community of e-learning and distance education uh, providers uh, must see as a challenge how to use technology uh, not uh, as, as a vehicle for, for closing the gap, uh, not um, uh, like it is now for many of the seniors. It is a barrier. The technology is a barrier. We have been lucky to have had the opportunity to work with technology in order to, to uh, provide learning opportunities. But for the seniors, it is a barrier. Open learning to me means disassociating the idea that education happens solely within schools. Um, and I think it, we're going to learn from the, the free culture and the open software and the open source movements to see how we can build learning structures that exist independently outside of institutions. Thank you. Well, I will go back to the meaning of learning. What's the goal of learning? Of course, to know more, to understand the world, to be part of the human culture. These are very noble goals, but there is also one other goal, to get a job. And if you look to the, and I as I represent the Commissioner of, for Employment in the European Commission, I m must speak about it that the European labor market shows that something wrong with our education, something wrong with our learning methods. Otherwise, we wouldn't have so many unemployed people in this country and uh, everywhere in Europe. We wouldn't have one million empty jobs in Germany, and we wouldn't have millions of migrants who are coming from so-called third countries because there are jobs which European uh, people, young and older, don't, don't want to f fulfill. So I think. Uh, of course, uh, it's very nice to uh, have open learning systems and to reform and reform, as uh, Bob Fryer uh, spoke about yesterday, how many e educational reforms happened here in Europe. But at the end of the day, we should uh, concentrate, uh, can we give jo uh, 
th that kind of skills and knowledge which makes people uh, ready to, to, to get jobs in our uh, competitive and changing world, and the answer is not exactly as well as in many other parts of the world. Okay, thank you. And Paolo, would you like to uh, react to that as well? well? Open learning means that uh, open learning gener generations means that we are facing a networked society. So um, also we are facing um, knowledge um, networks of knowledge, and um, we are facing a new way to 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 experience the world, to experience learning. Open learning generations means the confluence of all these people, all these worlds, all these views of the world uh, to a new way or a new environment, a new new kind of scenarios that we should develop to the future. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, uh, and I think this does. Um, uh, this was uh, picked up very nicely as well by David White this morning. I think you said uh, uh, learning takes place uh, from the cradle to the grave, but does the education system support this? as a lifelong process. And uh, this is reflected as well in some of the questions that uh, have been coming in. So uh, to explain to the people in the room and also to the people who are watching this uh, via the, uh, the live stream, um, we've uh, uh, been streaming the, the keynote plenaries and uh, we've been collecting questions in via Twitter. So uh, I have some questions from uh, the audience who was in the room and also following at a distance for you that we'll move on to next. And there will obviously be time in this session for people here in the room to ask questions as well. So uh, this was really just to, to kick us off. Um, so some of the things that uh, we've been picking up from Twitter, um, uh, some of them are directed to particular um, keynote speakers and, and other uh, presenters. Uh, and, and some of them are more general questions, so feel free, uh, obviously, any of you to, to intervene uh, when it inspires you. Um, this is perhaps not one of the easiest questions to, to start with, but uh, uh, it was one of the first ones to come up, and uh, this is particularly directed, uh, a question for, for Dale. It's the notions of uh, non-schooling and unschooling. Um, and is there a difference for you? If there is, is it semantic or does it mean something else? For me, the difference in terminology is fairly semantic. Um, and I actually would go as far as saying I actually don't like the term unschooling. Um, I don't like defining something by what it's not. Uh, I would much rather have the term in, in, in German, for example, unschooling is called free learning is the translation. Um, and. I like that term, except that in the English language, free learning has no association whatsoever. Um, so to a large extent, I use the word unschooling because if I use the word homeschooling um, or custom schooling, uh, people immediately jump to conclusions about religious homeschooling and ask, you know, did your parents refuse to teach you evolution? Um, which is not at all the case. It was a very, very different experience um, from re re religious homeschooling. I would, I would love to come up with a new term that defines learning and uh, free learning as something positive, not anti-school in any way. Um, so far, I have not come up with a compelling word. So if you have any ideas, let me know. OK, does anybody on the panel have any ideas on this? Or people, perhaps, who are more representative of institutions, and how do you react um, when you hear the younger generation saying, we don't, we don't want your school, we don't want your education system, we want to create it our way? Why don't you like free schooling? Uh, because free schooling doesn't have any association in the English language. Unschooling at, at least has some existing connotation. Um, and Can't you make it happen? Yeah, you, you can. Um, I, I don't like free schooling because it's two words. Um, and you can make it into one. <laughs> Yes, Bob. Yeah. I, I have some sympathy with, with Dale's approach because I don't want all learning to be captured by pedagogues. I think of some of the most important learning we do as human beings. Um, I have a great friend who's been studying learning in children up to the age of six months and then beyond. In those first six months, learning to recognize noises and smells and visual indicators from mothers and fathers about food, about comfort, about love, about attention, and a sense of safety. And if you think about what happens after that period, those wonderful early recognitions uh, that come in very small children, we learn to communicate in different ways, eventually to talk, 
we learn to walk. And I often say, if educators and pedagogues have been in charge of those three important kinds of learning, some of us will end up as failures in stumbling. You know, because what pedagogues like to do is have hierarchies of achievement. That's what pedagogues like. They like to sort. Pedagogy is about sorting. And sorting is very often about hierarchy, not about diversity. And my feeling is that there's lots of learning that goes on that I want institutions to keep well away from and professional pedagogues to keep well away from. And therefore, I want a much more universal conception of learning than is captured by very important specialist institutions whose job it is to give learning. I'm not, I'm not against institutions. I'm just saying I don't want them to appropriate all the domains of life for learning. So that raises the question of who and how should we support that wider learning. And if you go back to my example of the three, of the three bits of learning that very small children do, communication uh, through visual signs, speaking and walking, for example, what could we do to support that kind of learning to make it socially just and fair so that all children had the same opportunities? Uh, in that. That's a really interesting question, how you would do that without appropriating the learning that's going on. I hope that's not too obscure a point, but that's what gives me some sympathy for the line that Dale's promulgating this morning. Okay, I think, uh, Gaud, you had some contribution to, to, to add. nurture, to nurture and take care of creativity and the curiosity. I think the concept, the idea of unschooling is uh, it's extremely exciting and it is an important contribution to the debate on learning and it should be continued. However, I think we have to see learning in different contexts because learning in, in when you have 70 to 90 million children that don't have access to learning, you can't say unschooled to them, it is meaningless. It has a meaning here in Europe because we are rich and wealthy and we can have that as an option. But it's not an option for these 70 to 90 million. We have 700 illiterate adults, 700 million illiterate adults. We can't say unschooled to them. It's probably too late. But we should remember that unschooling in some kind of context within this group is already happened because more than 40% taking university education in, in the UK are adults. So I think we have to see uh, different target groups, different groups, different contexts, in that they have a different situation. And uh, therefore, you have to use different measures. And I agree because we need to achieve a social, just, and inclusive education that can be trusted by the citizens. Okay, this uh, links into um, uh, uh, another question that came in through Twitter from um, Prof. Teresa. Uh, and if you've got a Twitter handle called Prof. Teresa, then I think you're identifying, I think this uh, woman is identifying herself as a teacher. And uh, her question, which was to the whole panel, but uh, which was stimulated by Dale's talk, was, uh, but what about all the informal le learning that is happening in schools? Um, and maybe people would like to share their views and, and experiences of that, that it's not just uh, the very highly structured um, uh, approach that, that Bob was talking about, that, that, that in learn, informal learning is taking place in schools, and how can we nurture that, as, uh, I just as want Gerard to says? Pick up on, I think that I think there, there are many ways that institutions could become more unschooled without dismantling the institutions. You know, we could do away with grades and replace them with self evaluations. We could do away with teachers harping on homework and create peer accountability review boards, for example. Um, and to pick up on, on that last point about uh, unschooling being for relatively elite, well-off populations, that's a that's a view that I that that I very commonly hear and, and tried to pick up on my talk this morning, which is, in a way, a very nice compliment in the parlance of public school. It's to say that we're gifted, we're special, but on the on, on the other hand, it's a it's a dismissal of everybody else, saying that everybody else needs to be guided and tested and molded and so on and so forth. And I just don't think that's true. Um, and I think that there are many ways that we could help all of the world become relatively unschooled by giving them ways to give, give people knowledge and allow them to access it, to play with it, to learn with it, and, 
advance. Yes, I think uh, especially in uh, smaller communities or, or less developed communities, the schools have a lot of functions, not only the, as a part of the formal education. In, in a small village or an undeveloped area, a school is the only place where you can find a library, where you can find computers, where you can have either free or paying some fees, uh, language courses, or just mentioning the, the special schools of the ethnic or religious minority communities. Of course, these kind of schools is not only about the formal education of the given state, uh, but also it tries to uh, give a, a certain touch of the ethnic culture or the language culture of the religious culture. So I think if there is a less developed community, the schools have more uh, functions than just the formal schooling. What I think the issue about informal and non-formal learning always raises is how and where is it validated? Now, I don't think that validation of all sorts of learning simply means an endorsement of it, because for me, the process of learning always involves the notion of challenge and critique. And therefore, actually, simply to endorse it formal learning or non-formal learning is, in fact, a kind of patronizing attitude. And I don't think any education should be involved in patronizing people. But on the other hand, what has been the problem, I think, with formal education, it's not just schools, Dale, obviously, is it? It's elsewhere as well. In fact, it's par excellence in where I've spent my whole life in higher education, in very kind of uh, high quality universities in the UK, is what counts as knowledge and what counts as understanding and what counts as insight. And what we've got to do is diversify that so that we can enrich the learning culture with lots of other ways in which people have of learning and lots of other components of learning that people bring with them. And this requires a very different style of teaching. I'm an advocate of teaching. I think teaching is important. I think the abandonment of teaching is an absurdity. But it means a different kind of teacher to enable other forms of learning and other con conceptions of knowledge to come through to form part of the learning experience and the enrichment of those involved is a very, very uh, uh, skillful exercise. So what I would want to see happening to answer the, uh, the, 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 the inquirer about what about all that informal and non-formal learning that goes on in all educational institutions is that we've actually got to enlarge the skills and the competences of institutions and the professional staff institutions to recognize that learning doesn't need to be narrowed down, which is what we often do in these institutions, but broadened out. And that would be quite challenging, I think, to our conceptions of learning and knowledge and achievement, but particularly challenging to our professional competence. Okay, one of the, if, Dale, did you want to come in again on that? Or? Oh, I, I, I was going to say, Bob, that I, I, I think that, um, as there are certain things that we consider knowledge and cons consider not knowledge, there are also certain things that we consider that uh, an educated person should know. Right? We expect that you should read and you should write and you should be able to hold a conversation and be a member of society. Um, and in the same way, we tend to project those views onto other people. Right? So we expect our kids t to do that. And I think that the, the, the attitudes that have been shared on this side of the table are that you know, other people in other cultures should do that too. And I think that's a very dangerous place to go because I think should is a very dangerous word. Um, and I think it's, it's, it would be a mistake for us to assume that the way that we've been doing things, and quite arrogant, frankly, is the way that everybody else should do it too. Okay, yeah, one of, um, one of the things that we've been saying is um, a kind of push to get uh, uh, more use of social networks used in, uh, um, in, in learning. And this uh, links into a question uh, that we had uh, from, from Jack Kumi, who says, uh, from my small contact sample of young people, they resent their social networking being hijacked yeah. for educational purposes. And he's asking the question, does the panel think this is just from his small sample? Is it true in general, or do you have counterexamples? Um, I'd like to hear from you on, uh, on this. Of this resentment to... Uh, well, you're, you're nodding. I think Ask there are them. people out there that know the answer. Does anybody in the room have examples of this experience of, uh, of attempting to uh, develop social networks with, yeah. uh, 
uh, you, with, with younger learners. Okay, we have a microphone at the back. Ildiko is going to come over. This lady's good. Uh, we, we had one person, and then I'll come back to you afterwards. Yeah, we'll, have, we'll hand you the microphone. Hi, I'm Deborah Everhart. I'm chief architect at Blackboard. We did a lot of uh, research with students when we were exploring our new social learning capabilities, and they told us almost to a person that they wanted their academic networks to be separate from their social networks. I, I would like to give a, a, a really old example uh, because I think it might allow us some distance in, in the discussion. But in the early part of the 19th century, most of our universities did not have libraries. Uh, the libraries were held in social organizations of the students and fraternities. And the reason why students had fraternities and had libraries in those fraternities was they wanted to read current literature. They wanted to be able to talk about what was going on today. And the curriculum was not about that. And so there was a push in the institutions to kind of keep students from putting too many things in those libraries because it distracted them from the learning process. That all changed when universities became involved in research. And now faculty wanted to build libraries too. And then we modernized the curriculum and made it more interactive and more discussion oriented and that kind of thing. But this question of who owns the social environment, I think, is an important question for our time today. Facebook didn't start as an instructional environment. It started as an independent environment. Now institutions are intruding into it. But I, I, I do think it's important for us to have some distance on this issue because we're in the process now of trying to adapt our institutions to a very, very different social milieu. We're not in the industrial age anymore. We're in the information age. And the information, is, it, the information age is different, socially different, structurally different. And I, I would be interested in what the panel had to say about what is it that's different about today's emerging society that should be driving the discussion about learning and teaching and how we engage each other so that we have a sense of context for it. Okay, we have a question for the panel here. <laughs> I just one point that I was going to add on the previous question, though, um, which is that I, I think if you talk to students and asked about why they have a need to keep their, their personal and academic lives separate, it's probably because there's some fear or trepidation about how, what their teachers th would think of them or what the impact on their grades might be if their professionals knew what was going on in their personal lives. And I think that's, that's symptomatic of uh, this divide that we have between life and school. And if we didn't have that divide, there would be no problem. So how can we bridge that divide then? By getting people learning outside the classroom, by getting people to form salons and have people over, set up peer review boards and have people exchanging goals, getting students to rely on each other and take responsibility for their own education as opposed to relying on a professor or a university to give it to them. Ingeborg, yes. I think we're, we're talking just as every kind of learning is happening in schools and which is organized, but that's not true. So much learning is going on uh, uh, outside schools and, and uh, everywhere in society. I mean, uh, and it doesn't have to be recognized or validated or anything uh, to be important. Because, I mean, we want to learn, like, like we saw from the little baby looking at the washing machine, uh, learning. I mean, uh, some very good examples, and we, and we know that. But uh, the, the problem is to, to recognize that this is happening and that people are empowered by what they learn, and which um, means a development for them uh, personally. And then they can go to school, to institutions, to universities, if they, they uh, uh, learn something else. But uh, so much informal learning is, is going on uh, in, in society, and uh, the, the, uh, the challenge is for us to, to recognize it as, as an important part of the development. Okay, I think 
David wants to come in and unfold well, I, I just wanted to say that, I, and I'm, I'm sure this is a common experience, that when I think back about school, I, I recall the, the classes where in the English class, the, in, studying literature, the teacher would say one day, shall we look at Shakespeare or shall we have a chat? And we always said, oh, we'll have a chat. And then he would talk about literature and he would talk with us and he would talk interactively. And that's what I remember. It was brilliant. Now, I ask myself about the maths teachers. I don't recall the teacher who was doing the differential and integral calculus saying, shall we differentiate complex equations or shall we talk about it? And I wonder, schooling and learning is a mixture of exciting people's curiosity and acquiring technique. And some of the technique just has to be acquired, doesn't it? There's no, how do you unschool into differential calculus? I, I'm not sure. Maybe you can do without it. I know that I found maths uh, at some stages in school excruciatingly boring. And when I was working in the European Commission, we had a consultant who was a mathematician. And he could project mathematical concepts like that, and I could grasp them, and that was wonderful. But I think I needed some concepts in order to get there. And unfortunately, you know, as a kid, I needed to sometimes be made to acquire some techniques, otherwise laziness took control. Okay, we're down to Yeah, well, yesterday I compared two books. Uh, one uh, where the editor was Emma Tubella, from the Open University of Catalonia, and one uh, written by Göran Bexell, the rector of Lund University in Sweden. And uh, Göran Bexell, he wrote a book on 416 pages, and on half a page, he discussed the challenges from openness and online, okay? Uh, Emma Tubella, uh, in, with different articles of people from different universities, discussed very much the concept of innovation within universities. But what is common for these two books with the total different approaches, that is that they describe very much the same reality. It's too many students, too, too little guidance, too dull lectures, etc., etc., too low interaction. So they are very worry, worried about quality, the outcome uh, for the students. Uh, Bexell's uh, cure is more money, and I would say I support him, more money. I support also my own luck, winning in Lotto every week. But I think it's unrealistic, at least, my, at least to win in Lotto. I believe in the concept that Emma Tubella uh, is launching. And I think that the, if you want to change the educational system, you have to challenge the top management. Yeah. And they have to reinvent themselves. And I believe they will. Thank you. Okay, we've heard from the, yeah, the, the top-down approach. Um, I don't know if Bob's going to... Uh, well, can I... Uh, we've kind of got this. two different questions now. The question that, that uh, about the kind of students not wanting their social lives appropriated, I think raises a question which you mentioned earlier on about what trust we have in big institutions, educational institutions, and it suggests to me quite a low level of trust uh, we certainly found it in a little project we've been doing, this WebWise one that I mentioned yesterday, that, st that students not only hadn't thought about this area being important for, uh, for learning, but actually they were quite reluctant to get involved. When they got involved, they loved it, by the way, but they, they, they were very, very mistrustful in the first instance. To address the question about context, I thought it was a wonderful point that you made about context. I loved it. I tried to address that yesterday by suggesting that we're into this world uh, of uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, 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 un, uh, where we actually don't know about boundaries anymore, where we don't know about the rules. Um, you may remember what I suggested was, that I thought the 21st century was a, had a unique challenge and it was to combine the inheritance of Max Weber, which is about specificity and skill and rules and boundaries and clarity, which we need. When I get on an airplane tomorrow to go home to England, I don't want the pilot to say, um, good morning, good afternoon, I've never flown an aeroplane before, uh, but I'm a terrific creative learner. I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, we're all going to jump off. I want him. But on the other hand, if I'm over the Hudson River 
and the aeroplane fails. I want that pilot that was so imaginative. How can I save the maximum number of lives? He, he, nothing to do with his training. He puts the plane down in the river, you may remember. So what was Picasso? Picasso knew the rules. He could obey the rules. He could do any kind of painting and drawing that, that had existed hitherto. He was unbelievable in his teenage and early 20s. But then he knew how to transcend the rules to give us a new form of communication and representation. That's what I think is the unique challenge of the 21st century. And what's interested me listening to colleagues at this conference and learning from them is, is there something special about e-learning and new ways of learning that might actually allow us to combine those two philosophies, the Weberian philosophy of specificity and obeying the rules and, and, and working within the boundaries, because that's absolutely essential, but also that possibility of transcendence, of creativity, of imagination, of intuition, of grappling with newness, if you like. That seems to me the very context that you were talking about. Now, if I, I've been involved myself in my own country for my sins for about 15, 14, 15 years with government strategy and government policy on learning. And what I've noticed all the time is a narrowing down of the conception of learning rather than embracing this other way. And why is that happening? I think it's because we're more comfortable with that. It's an easier way of moving forward. I think it's going to be disastrous. And I think the narrowing focus, for example, on future occupational employability is bound to end in tears. Because who would have known what we needed now if they were writing in 1995? Nobody would have known. It's always failed. So we want, to, we want people able to get technical skills, but we want them also to transcend them. It's a very weird combination. That, I think, is the challenge of the context that you raised. OK, we have a question over this side, and then we'll come back uh, to you. Sorry. Uh, I would just like to jump back to the Facebook and uh, uh, how much privacy we have. I have the feeling, being quite young, so still probably more of a student than anything else, isn't it a bit hypocritical that uh, we learners expect uh, formal or whatever education to uh, merge into our entire life for 24-7 and not be able to adopt our uh, virtual persona uh, to this whole big community and the environment. We are already showing some kind of a different virtual identity when we create our avatars and create our own personalities in Facebook or LinkedIn. Every one of us, I think, who have uh, who are partners or, or members of these two communities know how different they are. I wonder if it would be requesting some kind of flexibility for the, from the learners to adopt their virtual presence in Facebook and not just expect the trust from their uh, teachers or educators. Yeah, I wanted to speak about uh, the topic which was uh, debated here, but I tried to answer at the end uh, very shortly and other colleagues will follow me. Well, uh, of course, I think uh, the happy people, those are the happy people who for whom the job is also entertainment. Those who enjoy their job for, for those people who enjoy every day to go to their working place. And the same goes for education inside the school or outside the school. If you enjoy that you learn something, that's I think it's a very good feeling in the life. But it, does, it doesn't happen every time. It, it doesn't happen always. Then so change it. Yeah, sorry? <laughs> Didn't change it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, change it. Yeah, you change it. Enjoy what you do. Do something uh, the, else. The question: What do you want to change? The school, yourself, or the life, or the world? If you want to change the whole world, it, it takes a lot of time. I don't want to be the advocatus diabolicus here, but really, if we see our 21st century uh, global market, global economy, we see that the most successful people on the labor market, those who have very disciplined education in China, in Japan in Thailand, in other countries. I was there, I know what I'm talking about. You mentioned, David mentioned Shakespeare. When I learned English in the school, first we had a very boring old half British, half Hungarian uh, teacher. She was quite bad. And then came a young lady who taught English to us through the Beatles and Rolling Stones, the text of the Beatles and Rolling Stones and uh, etc. hits. And of course, everybody listened to it because we had a op good opportunity first to hear the music and then to learn the text, and that's how uh, we could learn. And I, I think it's a short example how 
can we unite the entertainment and, and the need, the necessary things uh, be, which has to be learned. But, but if you want to learn grammatics, perhaps it's not so uh, easy, not so entertaining, it's not so real entertainment like uh, just uh, learning the text. So I think, uh, I think uh, the entertainment side of learning to enjoy, to get something is very important, but still there are so-called technical knowledge, and I'm not speaking about the computer, but technical, the grammatics, the mathematics, the basic of every, every science uh, sometimes is not only entertainment, but we have to learn it. Yeah. I have a question I'd like to pose to the panel in the room, if, if that's all right. So a question that you would like yeah. to ask? Everyone. Everyone. Um, one of the most important aspects of education for me, and this was even true outside school, was the community of people in which I learned. People who were there to support and challenge me, question me and push me along. And that's not something that I've seen solved in online learning yet. Does anyone have any examples of communities being built in online environments that provide the same support that exists when communities form in the real world? Okay, does anybody want to share their example with us? So we have the microphone. And then of course you can always ask, you can all ask your, your burning questions to the panel as well. It's been switched around. It's, it's a flipped session. We have yeah, very good. This is a flipped panel session, very yeah. Good. It's difficult to speak generalities about your question because each community is a little bit different. But an anecdote might help, uh, might help you. Uh, we offered at Penn State a master's degree in acoustical engineering and the student online. And the students were all employed by companies far away from Pennsylvania. They were in Canada, they were in Washington State, they were in Texas, they were very far away. They never physically met uh, until the day of graduation when they all came to campus for graduation. But they had one faculty member that they really liked. And so they all got together and they agreed to come to Pennsylvania and to throw a party for them. Uh, they contacted the departmental secretary. They found a place to hold the party. They agreed on a program for the party. They agreed on presents for the party. Uh, they talked to the man's wife and arranged for her to keep a secret of the fact that they were having a party. <laughs> and they made it happen. That's an anecdote of a community in action. And it's one example. But it's, it's the kind of things communities do. And these communities were communities of physical strangers. They had never seen each other. But they were colleagues. And they became friends. And they can do that online. Uh, and I think it happens all the time. All the time. So. Could I give another example? You, yeah, of course. Well, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the forms of, of civic engagement that are emerging in modern society. One of the things I'm really interested in is how people manage illness, and in particular, how parents manage illness in their children. And one of the wonderful things that's happened through the growth of the use of the internet and, and online activity is that virtual communities, if you've got a child suffering from a chronic disease, or shall we say asthma or something like that, you can be talking to people around the world about how they manage and handle asthma. And I've taught, my own work has been in health in the last 10 years. And hospital consultants in asthma and other chronic diseases, I only give that as one example, have said to me, we benefit enormously from these communities of what they now call expert patients. And uh, there are numerous, numerous examples of people learning from each other around the world how to handle and how to support long-term illnesses, which would have never have been possible before because it would have had to have been through letters or, or formal physical meetings. And if you've got a child that needs 24-7 uh, uh, a care, which many of these children with long-term illnesses need, if you've got a child dying of cancer or over a long period with childhood leukemia or whatever it is, actually online becomes a very important community of support, of information, of advice, and yes, of expertise as well. Okay, and this does bring us on to um, another question that came in through Twitter. 
uh, which was, um, what do you think, as a panel, it was particularly addressed to, to Dale, but I think each member of the panel can answer this one. Um, what do you think of learning in communities of practice, which include um, elders and youngsters? Uh, does anybody have any experience of this happening for, for real? This was what Bob was saying was in a specific context around healthcare. But in general, um, is this uh, something that, uh, uh, that we, we see in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, is the learning identifiable? Um, does anybody want to contribute on this? So learning in communities of practice um, in, involving uh, the two generations, which is bringing us back to closing the gap uh, as part of the, uh, the theme that we're discussing. As an unschooler, our learning groups were not limited to a single age. Most of the groups had an age range of, of at least five years, um, ranging from, say, 12 to 17-year-olds coming together to learn a particular subject. Um, and we also had other groups um, where parents and, and young people uh, who were interested in the same topic went about learning the same thing together. Um, so we had an English group that did that, for example. There were three parents and three unschoolers who went about learning um, English at the same time, at the same pace, and engaged in the same way. Okay, and I think uh, you talked to us about the Grandfathers and Grandsons yes, Initiative, yes, I yes, think, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a very interesting and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a very interesting initiative inside the European Union when so-called uh, grandchildren uh, teach so-called grandfathers. It means that young uh, volunteer students from uh, mostly uh, primary and secondary school, they teach old people who are curious to learn how to use the computers and yeah, internet. Absolutely. And also, I know many examples out of this initiative, many schools or clubs or even political parties branch all over Europe. Uh, they have special courses where old people can learn how to use the computer and internet. And of course, the so-called teachers, the voluntary, unofficial teachers are mostly young, very young people people, usually teenagers. Okay, and if you then, Paolo, yes. Um, just a comment first uh, about, uh, about the support, uh, how we do uh, give support uh, in, uh, in online learning to, to students like you, you find in, in, uh, in a physical environment. Uh, that is uh, a very, very important aspect on, uh, of developing uh, e-learning distance education to have the two-way communication uh, between the student and, and the teacher. It has to be there. And, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the, the students uh, help each other uh, form groups uh, and support uh, in the learning. So that's uh, the motivational part of it, the support and the guidance is a very important part of, uh, of the development of uh, open and distance learning, e-learning. Um, as to examples uh, in um, learning communities where uh, different generations can uh, learn from each other, um, I've seen from my own country in Norway that, that schools, for instance, one of my grandchildren, she went to, with, with her class to, to an elderly, uh, home for elderly, and she learned to knit. The elderly uh, uh, taught the, the children, oh, she came along, see, oh, I, can you uh, uh, teach me more about this, how to, how to knit? Uh, that's another thing, uh, that they, uh, they can um, uh, be together, and she she um, learned to pay respect to to uh, this old lady teaching her to to um, uh, to knit, and and to see that she knows something that I don't, and and of course uh, I've also seen uh, classes um, uh, whole classes going to to uh, or inviting uh, seniors to come to school and teaching them. Uh, how to use the, the technology. Uh, so, uh, and in, in this way, uh, there can be an exchange of experience and knowledge, and also uh, the seniors can um, maybe sometimes be more critical to, to uh, what is on the net, help the, the, uh, the young ones to, to question what is there. I mean, there's an exchange of, uh, of uh, competences. So it is working both ways then? Yes. Okay, yes. Holly, you wanted to uh, yes. continue. Um, I want to say about uh, communities of practice and, uh, or learning communities that, uh, for, for instance, 
for example, in my university, the Open University, we have students from different ages, 22 years old, 50, 50, more than 50 years old, and all of them work in virtual class groups, and um, they work together. The problem is that uh, to have a community, we need to share goals and uh, objectives and uh, define the identity of the group in this, uh, in the, in this, from this, this, uh, this way. So if they have the same um, goal, they work together. They may be able to learn each other, which is very important. They mediate the, the communication, they mediate the learning processes, and that is the important and that is the, the way to make the cohesion of the group. But I want to say more, something more about um, a previous question concerning formal and informal education. I think it's connected in a certain way with this. Um, informal is a way to, to feed the formal level also. That is very important if we think that um, learning is a kind to provide um, the student with competences and skills to innovate. And learning to, to be an innovator is, very, is, 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 our, is our main goal. Well, this morning we are talking about curiosity, uh, creativity, create, creativity, and um, learning uh, to be an innovator means to be incremental or disruptive. And um, more than that means learn to solve the problems that to, we don't know yet what you're going to face in the future. Exactly. And that is the main question. Exactly. Also, with this new kind of communities of practice. OK, it's also a question that was asked via Twitter as well. Um, I don't know if, God, you wanted to intervene before I ask the next question, and then uh, we'll follow on. Yeah, Deborah, I want to as well. I want to refer to a particular community of practice. What, uh, if I can be allowed to just have a critical remark that it seems to be uh, a view that uh, younger generations are more capable of uh, uh, meeting the challenge from the digital world. And I'm a little critical to that because we have evidence from research that the capacity to tackle digital issues it's more about what you could call digital habitus, the capacity to, to use by individuals digital means, and not a question about age. Uh, so, to, so to speak, say that the younger generation have the capacity to handle all the digital means, but the elderly don't, I think that is totally wrong, to be honest. And um, I also think we saw the same when all these e-things came along in the 90s and the beginning of the one, uh, 2000. Uh, at that time, I was in the European Commission, by the way. And at one time, even us working in the DG Information Society, we said, e -e -e enough is enough. Uh, Very good. Very good. <laughs> and that was, that was because, for example, it was always about the, this technology was handled best by the younger, etc., etc. E-commerce, e-learning, whatever. Basically, I, I don't, I don't believe in that. I believe it is about the capacity to use it. You have to learn it. You have, you have to mature, so to speak. And if you look at the real innovation happening now within learning, uh, that is done by uh, examples that uh, Yuda City or or uh, MIT X. What they have done is that they have simplified the methods so it can be used by thousands, hundreds of thousands, all over the world. And these people that are using the technology are not people 15 and 70 age of age. It is people on 30s, 40s, etc. So I think just to, to be a little critical, to closing the gap, okay, what actually are we closing? Thank you. I think the most interesting example of a community of practice that I've seen in the last three years is the Arab Spring, which was a remarkable use of social media between generations. And you saw older people, and in particular it was really interesting, people who had been excluded from political discourse 
millions of women on the streets for the first time in their lives, for the first time in recent history. And social media was a very, very important component of that. They adapted that social media as a political learning experience between generations. It was quite phenomenal. And I well, maybe some of you, but I, I would never, ever have predicted it. I would never have expected. Somebody said earlier about the adaptation of technologies to inventive purposes. Uh, and I think that was a, one of the most inventive purposes. They, and the inability of authoritarian states to deal with that is an incredibly interesting question. And you're absolutely right. It wasn't a generational thing necessarily. It was a question of people finding through a new medium, through uh, uh, social media there, a means of generating a sense of, of community, of collectivity, of the possibility of political action. For me, that was absolutely exhilarating. Now, of course, to carry it through and make it happen in everyday practice raises other so sorts of questions. It wasn't the answer to everything. But as an instigation of a social movement, as a kind of community of political practice, I found it utterly remarkable. I don't know whether the rest of you did, but I found it utterly astonishing. Okay, we're going to take uh, Eula's uh, contribution to the conversation, and I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience who've come with their own questions, so uh, it'll be over to the, to the floor after. Oh, after sorry, this. I'm very rude, but I'd like to raise a question. I'd like to use the opportunity that there are so many university teachers, professors here, so I'd like to raise a very practical question. If a young uh, student makes his, his or her thesis for you, and you realize that all data uh, facts, reference were coming just only from the internet and not from different sources. Would you accept it as a thesis which fits uh, the goal or not? Because it's a very practical question every university in Europe. Why aren't we asking that question to university students in the room? <laughs> <laughs> Where are the students? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about some questions from the uh, from the rest of you, uh, for, based on the conversations that we've been having here or on the keynotes that you heard uh, uh, this morning. We had uh, lots more coming in from Twitter, so uh, if you don't have any, then uh, I've got my little uh, stock here that we'll uh, be running through. Okay, we have a question back there and then we'll come to you, Costas, yes. Just a, a question to Dale, uh, uh, this unschooling, for whatever, whatever term we're going to call it, concept. Uh, how do people emerge into disciplines uh, or learn about disciplines or learn about the discipline of learning? Uh, is this, uh, your story during the Q&A after the presentations was an interesting one when you mentioned Rebecca learned because she was selling Beanie, uh, beanie Babies online. Well, what if she didn't have Beanie Babies? I mean. Could, could this have happened when she was 17 and, as you said, she learned to read at nine? I, I, I'm just kind of curious if it's this open, uh, do we run great risks? Uh, who are going to be the next cadre of engineers, of computer scientists, of pilots? Uh, you're, Bob, that's, it was a scary thought when you referenced it. I'm, you know, I, 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 didn't go to, I didn't go to pilot school, but I'm flying the plane. So help, help me understand that a little bit more, dear. So the, the way that I went about deciding what I was going to learn was very much in terms of what I thought that I needed to know to get into college because that's the goal that I was aiming for. So I made sure that I took four years of high school English and four years of math and four years of science and so on and so forth. Now, I didn't do those in exactly the same way that anyone would have in a normal high school. Um, you know, I, instead of taking four years of French, I went and lived in France for six months, for example. Um, and so that 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 was the that that those were the guidelines that I was following. And at an earlier age, I was following the guidelines set out by the state of uh, California, which had suggestions for the, th the types of things that you should learn at different age ranges. And of course, I didn't sit down and like read a history book about the Civil War in fourth grade. Um, I think I went to a history museum or something, did something else that still fulfilled that requirement. So they made sure that I was more or less keeping myself in track with what someone might learn at a standard age. Um, and certainly, Rebecca might not have had 
Beanie Babies, but maybe she was interested in science and bought a science kit in order to use the science kit. She had to learn to read or something. I don't know. Um, I I think that I think the most basic functions of reading and writing and math, for example, you'll probably pick up along the way if you're if you're genuinely curious about something, and school hasn't beaten that curiosity out of you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kostas Tsoulakidis from uh, University of the Aegean in Greece. Um, I'm partially covered from the previous question to Dale, which I wanted to, again to ask him. Uh, we know that, uh, well, going back to basics, whatever school means, means that, uh, well, it gives information and data and methods and the rules of society. And uh, the whole thing uh, is based on accreditation. How uh, you, uh, well, with the idea of unschooling or relatively, uh, the, the relative ideas that go with it, uh, can, can make anybody that has followed that path convince the others of, of his, his or her knowledge about anything. And how can one fit into society that, uh, well, the whole, as the whole school uh, procedure leads to a accreditation, a kind of uh, credits and uh, degrees and all this. That's the I don't fit into society and I'm proud of that. Um, and that's the community of people that I curate around me. And I think one of the dangers of going to school is that you curate this notion that you have to fit into society. Um, so I don't see that as a problem with unschooling. I see that as a, as a huge plus of unschooling. It creates a community for people who don't fit who are the rebels, who are the misfits, who don't go into the mainstream. Well, yes. I think this and two of the previous questions, including your wonderful question, raise a, a really challenging issue for us involved in education, irrespective of whether it's digitized, and that is an epistemological question. And that is, what counts as valid knowledge? How do you test what counts as valid knowledge in the world? Now, we've developed kind of academic criteria for that, and I would apply no different criteria to knowledge which was generated from the internet to knowledge which comes from questionnaires or from observation or from experimentation. In fact, my beginning approach, and I examine lots of PhDs, and maybe you won't want me as your PhD examiner when you hear what I do, I start from the presumption all of what is presented in the thesis is open to challenge. Everything is open to challenge that is argued. Every, every table, every statistic, every argument, every reference. Because just putting a footnote reference in doesn't mean that what you've referred to has any validity in itself. In fact, I often discourage people to put lots of footnotes and references in because I think it's an excuse for, argument, for not having an argument, and I'd much rather have the argument. So. We, I think the whole question now of digitization, of the explosion of sources of information that you were talking about earlier, does raise interesting questions about what should count as knowledge. Now, the interesting thing is we've lost something somewhere between uh, uh, modernized, the, mo the modern world and the late modern world of what counts as knowledge. If you go back to the time when lots and lots of people didn't have schooling, and didn't have education, it didn't mean they didn't have knowledge and that they didn't have wisdom. They had wisdom and knowledge which came from everyday living in the world, from practical activities, whether it was farming or making things or whether it was fighting in a war or being an international diplomat. It, and, and what happened with the advent of schooling, with many, many wonderful things which happened with schooling, Interestingly, in the UK, literacy wasn't one of them. Literacy was higher before schools were first introduced, which is curious. Um, but lots of wonderful things happened with schooling, but we lost a conception of practical, everyday knowledge and wisdom which had validity in its practice in the world. And it does seem to me that the digital age raises yet again what shall count as knowledge. And what I would want to argue is that what counts as academic knowledge and academic validity should not be the only test of validity. And I think we much more, need a much more plural, a much more diverse, and as a consequence, a much more challenging conception of what counts as valid knowledge. And I think digitization raises that in absolute 
boundaries or uh, boundlessness is of possibilities. And I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer, but I know it raises the question, uh, a deep question of epistemology, uh, which in a sense we've not had to bother about through the age of modernity, from about the early bits, bits of the 19th century to the end of the 20th century, the explosion of the information age that you talked about so interestingly earlier is that it raises again issues which we haven't had to talk much about for a long, long time because we had a particular criterion of knowledge which was kind of scholastic and academic. Now, I happen to like scholastic and academic knowledge. It's by luck or by birth, it's what I happen to be reasonably good at, and I've made my living at it, and I've been very happy. But I don't have any illusion it's the only kind of knowledge which gives a valid humanity and a valid, a valid conception of the good life. I don't have that illusion at all. Okay, anybody want to follow up on that or to ask a, a further question? Um, Hello, Anna is my name from Schenger in Italy. I was wondering um, whether we actually do know at what age we are um, deciding, okay, now uh, you're at university and now you can learn more self-guided or whether it, it's actually possible that a model like that might work after a certain age, after learning to read, after learning, having some basic skills, after having good teachers that bring you to, you know, follow, following your own uh, intrinsic motivation to learn, and I don't think that is necessarily, necessarily coincide with entrance into university. But I also want to say that, um, you, you know, uh, actually, actually, I liked a lot your keynote today because it was very, of course, it was very challenging, and a lot of people might have, you know, uh, shaking their head also a lot of times. Um, but uh, I think what you were proving is that. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're curious, you can go ahead and you can, uh, uh, using a lot of tools that are around right now, but at the same time you were pointing to a lot of sources that are, uh, that are provided by higher education institutions, as they are right now, which is somehow maybe a little conflict there. So ba basically two, two statements or questions. So the question is, at, at what age? Might people be ready to engage in self-directed learning? Yes, because I guess um, uh, if you're, um, I, I'm not sure um, whether you are saying uh, unschooling is only for the rebellious, you know, don't fit into school, or whether you're saying uh, that every kid actually would be able or would be more successful, would learn better if they would be able to pursue their own teaching, uh, their, their own interests, their own motivation. Unschooling for me at the most basic level is not about a rejection of school or about leaving school, but about making a conscious de decision about how to educate yourself. So if you're in school because you know that you like structure, because there's a certain professor that you want to talk to, because there's a certain laboratory that you want to work in, then more power too. And if you've made that decision yourself, then you are an unschooler in my book. Unschooling is about making the choice. Um, and if you've made the choice that you don't want to go to school, then more power to you, too. If you, you've made the choice that you want to do some of both and curate your own educational experience and take a course online and take a course at a local university and go join a co-working space, then awesome. Um, I think everyone would benefit from making their own decisions as opposed to letting society or parents or teachers or guidance counselors tell us what to do with our lives. Okay, I think this brings us to um, another question that came in through, through Twitter, which was uh, um, from... Uh, uh, which was, are all kids as self-motivated as Dale J. Stevens? And it would be interesting to see how scalable this model is. So I think inherent in that question is, is this model of uh, self-learning and unschooling, whatever you want to call it, something that we want to drive towards? Is it something that we see as scalable? Is it desirable to scale this up to a more general level? Um, I'd like to hear what the panel have to say on that question. So first, I'd like to say that I'm actually not that self-motivated. I'm a really lazy person. Um, and I tend to go for really high leverage points in situations, which means that I can do the least amount of work possible. Um, and I'm not someone that goes and sets out goals and is just going to meet them all by myself. But I've set up very specific methods to replace the, in the extrinsic systems. So for example, I have friends that I exchange goal lists with on, on weekly basis. And they check in with me, and I check in with them. And together, we make sure that we're on track. So it's not just that I'm self-motivated, it's that 
I've figured out how to build systems and learn from other unschoolers about how to build systems to replace the extrinsic motivation with intrinsic motivation. Sort of form of self motivation, perhaps. Uh, well, I think it really depends on the personality. So I knew uh, two guys who failed uh, the entry exam to the Berlin Film Academy, and later they became professors at the same university for which they were not uh, suitable as students. So, of course, it depends on the personality and depends only also on the age. Some people are very independent when they are a child. Some people are becoming independent-minded when they are older. So I don't think there is a universal receipt for everything. But if I have the micro for one more uh, minute, I'd like to speak about, because the generation was also our topic, that of course, as the life expectancy is higher and higher, thanks God, in Europe, and almost uh, everywhere in the developed world. Of course, there is an old generation, because I was talking about uh, knowledge, skills for uh, employability. Of course, there is a generation which don't want to work further over 70 or 75, and still they want to understand the new life in which they live. So I think for them, this kind of unschooling, this, this kind of entertainment-like uh, learning is very important, and, and, and I think uh, we should understand that uh, even the oldest people have a right, a social right to, to learn, and they should get the access for learning. So you were saying about the, the enjoyable nature of learning yes. as well, yeah, yes. which is a theme that's going to be dealt with yeah, in a forthcoming yeah. Eden conference, so uh, we look forward to uh, continuing that discussion in, in Oslo next year. Um, any further questions I think we have? Just a, I should have introduced myself, Bruce Shalhoub from the Sloan Consortium USA. I, I want to go back to Gard's point. If, if I heard the numbers correctly, 70 million illiterate non-readers, was that? 700 million. Um, in the world, okay. In the, in the world, okay, thank you. Um, so, so, there, and and the, there are probably 700 million reasons why they don't read. Uh, but my guess is that most of them did not get into some formal educational system or process. Uh, particularly even the early grades where basic fundamental reading concepts uh, are either intrinsically picked up or forced and I'm and I would I would submit that there are some who are forced but they have basic concepts they have basic reading concepts so so the broader question becomes in this kind of a, in, an, in an open arrangement where we kind of let individuals pick and choose when they want to learn what they want to learn how they want to learn really can it work what what, what is the risk does the 700 million become 1.2 billion in five years? That's what would concern me. Uh, I, I, and I'd rather tackle the problem the other way. I do think there is, I, I do think one of the things that, that open and online learning can do is to provide those degrees of freedom. And I think it's already doing that. I do believe it's, it's creating great uh, learning uh, activities, student to student and faculty to student. Um, and there will be more of that as the tools get better and as our faculty and teaching techniques get better. But that, the risk involved with kind of going to this kind of open, let's do it when we want to do it, what, do what we want to do when we want to do it. I mean, I, I still haven't gotten a question to where's the next category of engineers coming if everyone just kind of does whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. Or pilots, Bob, I, I, just, I love the pilot thing, so. Okay. Off my soapbox. Um, it's a terrific question, and, and I don't know how we'd do that, that calculation. But I just want to pull back a little bit. I, I mean, I'm a big advocate. I, I, I want to reform and strengthen formal learning. One of the things I'm concerned to do is, in a sense, to get governments out of the hair of teachers. Because I think what's been one of the big deformations have been government policies and government targets. And for that, I would even include, I'm sad to say, the European Union. And I want to see, I've, I, I, I have uh, three children, my wife and I have three children. One of our children's turned out to be a teacher. She's a very gifted teacher. She's a wonderful teacher. And I think teaching is one of the noblest professions of all. And I think it deserves honor, but it also requires rigor. 
It requires an enormous amount of rigor. Um, and what I want to see is a return to a level of trust between teachers uh, providing learning in a whole variety and plurality of, of ways and not letting the government interfere in that relationship because they seem to me to distort it, uh, particularly targets. They, they have a terrible distorting effect upon the processes of learning, both upon those who do the teaching and those who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of the teaching. So one of the things I would hope that online the digitization can do is to create new opportunities for that trust to develop and strengthen. Now, one of the things that means, I think, is that the continuous professional development of teachers becomes an incredibly important thing. The idea that you can learn all there is to do about teaching when you're 21 or 22 and then just do it for another 50 years seems to me to be crazy. And I want diverse influences so that we come to regard teaching becomes the most sought after work in our society, the most competitive area, the most highly regarded. And of course, there are historical examples where the teachers, and David was referring to one of the world's great teachers, he might have done equally the same with Confucius, he may have done the same with all sorts of other people. I want to see the teaching part of the teaching and learning relationship elevated to the highest possible contribution to our collective benefit. And that will require quite a radical change because if you look at the history of education in different countries, as governments increasingly become involved, so they narrow the conception of teaching and learning. So I would just hope, and maybe you can give me this hope, that digitization offers the opportunity of opening that up again. And, and I know that's a kind of romantic notion. I know it is a kind of utopian notion, but I actually think that utopianism is incredibly important. I actually think emotion is very important. As a, a great friend of mine who was a president of a trade union said when he was accused of emotionalism in his argument, he said, if it weren't for emotion, very few of us would be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dad, I think he wants to follow up. Yeah, well, the question was, could you scale up uh, uh, self-learning? And uh, again, I think that we have to put it into context. Uh, if the target is to nurture creativity, uh, curiosity, and you know, build on this wonderful capacity that uh, youngsters uh, have, I think that uh, self-learning and schooling can be nurtured both uh, uh, on the outside of, so to speak, and inside the educational system. I, I think it is not one formal. It is not uh, one answer on this. But there are so many other contexts where it is, it is almost irrelevant to talk about self-learning and, and, and unschooling only, only. And for example, if you think uh, on the dropouts or the, the, the push-outs, push in, uh, in uh, the high school system. It is average 25% in OECD. In OECD. Well, you, you can't say unschool, uh, be, be a self-learner. And if you look into research done on this field, for example, in my home country, Norway, a considerable part of these 25%, they have uh, psychic problems. They, they are really ill in some way. Uh, they, they don't feel good. And uh, I think we have to go more basic uh, into this and look how can we stimulate the system so our youngsters don't become ill of the education system, etc., etc. So I, my, my answer on scaling is that it has to be seen within its context, where it can help. But you shouldn't use the same method for all parts of the problems we are trying to, to solve. They are too big to that, so okay. thank you. Thank you, Gert. Uh, Gert and um, Bob, you both brought us to um, one of the uh, uh, examples that I wanted to start to conclude on. Um, Bob, more from a, a negative point of view, get governments out of the, uh, the hair of, of teachers and, uh, and, and these uh, targets and indicators. Uh, and also, uh, Gert's example of uh, 
disillusionment with, uh, with education and dropout rates. And this came in through uh, one of the contributions on Twitter, which was uh, sharing with us uh, this morning's press release from the European Commission um, on uh, the progress towards the target of reducing um, early school leaving. And uh, the, uh, it, it does say progress in reducing early school leaving and increasing graduates in Europe. There is progress, but more efforts are needed. And uh, the, the actual quote from that is, uh, um, member states need to focus on reforms and step up their efforts to implement comprehensive strategies against early school leaving. They need to boost access to higher education while also increasing its quality. Equipping young people with the right skills and qualifications will help Europe to fight youth unemployment, to overcome the crisis, and make the most of the opportunities created by the knowledge-based economy. Serious investment in education and training is a prerequisite for long-term success. Without proper funding, Europe will not win the global battle for growth, jobs, and competitiveness. And um, I don't know, you can see uh, European targets and indicators as uh, um, messing about with what teachers really want to do in, in the classroom, or you could see it um, as a goal that, in fact, we all want to strive towards. I don't think that, uh, um, you know, anybody would be against measures to reduce early school leaving. And uh, I'd just like the panel maybe to conclude with a few words on your reactions to that press release and what still needs to be done uh, if, uh, if we're going to use education in a way towards growth and uh, jobs for... Uh, I think focusing Europeans. solely on leaving, solely on, on changes just in school um, can be dangerous and you need to take into consideration into consideration other things like health and family status, for example. If you're trying to get 700 million people to learn to read, if that's a goal that we agree is admirable, does, does giving them schools necessarily do any good if they don't have the free time to use them or aren't healthy when they go to them? Um, and I think often we have to take a step back and think more holistically about what the purpose of education is. Okay, so I would like each of you to uh, give your concluding remarks on this. Uh, David, yes. Well, it's a, it's a mixture of remarks and not a mixture of points. On the, on the early school leaving, early school leaving means that for young people, education is a zone of failure. Uh, it's something they don't like because it has not worked. And I associate that with a number of the other issues that are there. Uh, <coughs> I, I was thinking about uh, my grandchildren. They will learn language. And they will learn it without being forced to do it because um, unless they have educational difficulties, they're surrounded by it and they will absorb it. I am learning classical Greek at the moment. If I learned it the way my granddaughter is learning English, it would take me 10 years. And I don't have 10 years. I want to learn it in a year. And in order to learn it in a year, I have to do some hard rope learning and that's no fun. And unfortunately, the thing that is going to make me do that is the fact that I have an examination next Thursday and I have to face the professor. And so I'm going to be working very hard on this once I get away. And that's no fun. And if I'm not forced to do that, in a sense, although I really want the outcome, I won't do it, which is why I'm not sort of polyglot. But what what is missing, it seems to me, in education still, and we've been saying it for years, in other areas, ICT has come in and it has radically changed the model. Now, ICT should be changing the model in language learning, for example, but I don't think it is. I think we're still using ICT as a sort of email or we're using it for social groups, but we're not changing the pedagogical method. And that, I'm still looking for that. It won't work everywhere. Uh, you can't learn to knit over the internet. My son rang me up at the office one day. Dad, I'm playing in the jazz band tonight, and I've got to wear a tie. I've got one of your ties. Tell me how to tie it. Do that over the phone you can. <laughs> Do it with a telephone in your hand, and you can't. Now, and the last one is, and this is for all of you, University teaching is the last profession for which you are required to acquire a qualification which doesn't qualify you to do the job. You get a PhD. That demonstrates that you're a good researcher. It doesn't demonstrate that you can teach anyone anything. And it's high time that was changed. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Okay, do we want to move on further down the table, Linda Bolton? Do you want to? Oh, okay. Yeah, the question, coming back to the question of early school leaving, or um, Juliet, yeah. On the early school leaving, I think this target is connected to the employment and poverty. If we want to raise the rate of employment and if we want to reduce the poverty, of course, we have to reduce the early school leaving. And, and I'm, I respect that very much, and I, I know that 1% of early school leavers be, will become like you, but 99%, and that's the sad reality, becomes either a young criminal or unemployed or prostitutes, they are lost for the society. Those in nowadays in Europe who don't, uh, don't finish a primary school, they don't have any future in the normal society, and, and they destroy and self-destroy, and that's, that's the sad fact. And 1% can become a genius, of course. Yeah, about early school leavers, it's not about only school leavers, it's, uh, it's the whole context of, of the life situation, uh, like uh, poverty, health, uh, many, many things. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that the Commission is, is pointing at, uh, at this issue. And I think that, that we, um, uh, in this room and in this conference, uh, dealing with, with uh, um, uh, motivating people to, to learn and to, to develop themselves and, and, to f and giving them possibilities to find something that, that uh, pleases them and makes them want to, to develop and, and, uh, and learn something. I think uh, that, is, that is an important role for, for us in this question. Okay, Paolo, is there anything that you want to add or guard or... Bob, on the question of... Uh... Okay, um, well, first of all, no, no one would object, as you rightly say, Deborah, to an objective. What, what, what I was objecting to in government interventions is if you start judging institutions and individuals against targets, what you induce is gaming. People will play games to show that they've met the targets. History shows us over and over and over again. I mean, most horribly, I guess, in the Soviet Union with its kind of production output, you know, of pig iron was always the big joke. But actually, we've seen it in British schools with targets and so forth. People engage in gaming. If their institution is going to be judged by that criterion alone, it's hopeless. But of course, I mean, school dropout is a complex phenomenon. It isn't just a negative experience. And, and we've got to be very careful about trying to understand why people drop out. Yes, at one level, it's an indictment. When I talked about honoring teaching, you've got to earn honor. Honor isn't just given. You have to earn it. You have to deserve it. You have to reproduce it all the time. But when, when, when kids are, are dropping out of education or older people are saying, not for me, thank God it's over, what we need to is understand what it is, what their motive is for saying that. What, and, and don't have any, none of us in this room have an illusion that the unemployment of Spanish youth has to do with the failure of Spanish education. The failure to provide jobs for Spanish youth has nothing to do with the education system. Let's not substitute education for other political and economic and moral and cultural issues in society. And we have a terrible educational illusion if we think we are both responsible for and we can resolve all of society's ills. And I think to lay the crisis of unemployment of youth in Europe at the problem of schools or education or early dropout is actually grossly immoral. We ought to raise the challenge and say, we know what the cause of unemployment is uh, in Spain, and it ain't anything to do with school dropout. On the other hand, we know that school dropout is associated with several other human unhappinesses and poor consequences. What we therefore need to do is not just to get people back in school, or not to do what we're doing in the United Kingdom, can you believe? We're going to have an obligation now to stay in school to 18. So if you hate it, you've still got to be there. What we've got to try and do is be inventive in ways of drawing people into the kind of learning that helps them to achieve. And that's why I'm, I'm interested in this notion that the internet gives us of diverse forms of learning and of achievement. That's what I think is its great promise, and that's the challenge to those of us in this room who are enthusiasts. Okay, thank you very much there. I'm afraid we really do have to stop because uh, uh, we've, we've come to the end of the time. This is one of those discussions that could go on for hours and hours and hours. I think our keynote speakers and other uh, invited experts are going to be around at the coffee break, so do feel free to ask them questions. Give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. 
And also, thank you to all the people who were following on Twitter and who contributed their questions to keep the debate going. And uh, thank you, everybody.